Mm -hmm. And done. One and done. done. Are we ready? What's going on guys, it's Travis from SES Integration. I am here with Trey. He's the director of SES Integration and we are at Times Square Church in Times Square, New York. And uh, we did a, an entire AVL outfit to this building in September of 2021. So today what we wanna do is walk you through that install, walk you through the products that we have on the install, talk about the system a little bit and some of the challenges that we came across when it came to this space. Um, something that is very unique. It's not just any other church as you can probably see in the background of just this original shot. This is quite the building. Um, so Trey, Indeed. give us a little bit of insight. Where are we? What, what is this building? Right, we're literally in the heart of Times Square, New York in what was a Warner Brothers theater at the time. It started out as a, uh, as a Broadway style theater show, right? So it's got all the traditional old school theater, uh, ornate finishes. Beautiful and molding. Tons everywhere. of historic aspects to this room. And it's actually a preserved historic site. So it produced a lot of challenges from that perspective. Sure, we had we had to do approvals for anything we wanted to change that would uh, that would change the look of the space. Yeah, right. Like typical things of hanging speakers that was fine that already existed, but the booth that we stand in, right, that was a big deal because we took out rows of seats and we leveled parts of the floor. It involved pouring concrete. I mean, it was a big deal that sure. they had to get approved and checked on. Um, and there was a, like you're saying, there's a tension in a, in a build like this. Yes, it's, it's super cool to be a part and we're honored to, to partner with the church here in this beautiful, beautiful right. space. But there is a, a lot of challenges, like you're saying, that mm -hmm. comes with upfitting and modernizing the technology while trying to preserve the integrity in the, of, in the history right. of the beauty of the space. At the end of the day, nobody wants to see the technology in the room. Sure. They want to experience it. They don't want to have to look at it. So especially in this kind of a space. So that right. was the that was the challenge for sure. Cool. I think we got there. I think we did. I, I think the, I'm proud of the team and how mm -hmm. it worked out. So what we'll do first is we're already at front of house. We're going to start with audio. Uh, specifically, we'll talk through PA. We'll kind of work our way along the line and then we'll go to our monitor world. We'll talk about the fixtures that are up in stage and then we'll go to video master control and talk through all of that. So first things first, PA, what do we got? Right. So. We partnered with L-Acoustics for this room. Uh, the church actually had an existing L-Acoustics PA. It was quite old. It was VDOSC for those of you that, that know L-Acoustics gear. Um, Fun fact, when did it come out? Do we oh, know? Oh, goodness. Uh, I knew at one point. It was a long, long time ago. It was uh, <laughs> VDOSC was kind of looked at as the uh, the father of the of line array, right? It was the first large format line array sure. in, in our industry that kind of took off with the whole, whole world of line, line source speakers. But we took that out and put in the brand new K3, which is, I guess, the newest of the K line from L Acoustics. And it, it has, uh, it, it definitely changed the look of the space drastically. It's gave, given us a really consistent um, visual element in the room, as opposed to the combination of VDOSC and DVDOSC. It kind of looked like a stack of mess, to be real honest. So we went with that. Uh, the coverage we were able to achieve from top to bottom in the room was was outstanding. Right. Which is, a, again, a, one of those unique challenges that's come with this space. It's right. the largest seating capacity auditorium for Broadway theaters in New York. Mm -hmm. So you, we've got a lot of space in the balcony, we've got a lot of space on the floor, and we need to give even coverage. That's right. So, and and sub-energy is probably one of the hardest things to do that with, right? Sure. Uh, getting front to back coverage in the higher frequencies pretty attainable these days with, with modern product, but sub-energy is, is quite a challenge. Uh, we used the KS21s from L Acoustics for that, and we, flow, we flew them six boxes per side beside the K3. Uh, the evenness of the low frequency in the room from top to bottom uh, even surprised me. I mean, yeah. we can look at models all day, but nothing tells a story like walking and listening, sure. right? So uh, when we actually experienced it for the first time in the space, the first night we turned it on, I believe it was around 11 o'clock at night, uh, and we experienced the PA for the first time, it was um, it was a chill bump moment, yeah. right? And we actually- a holy experience. Literally, you're right. <laughs> we literally uh, sat and enjoyed the PA for almost half an hour that night. I mean, before we did anything to it at all, we right. just turned it on and listened. And it was, it was quite nice. Yeah. So you're a great. big fan of the K3? I am. I'm a huge fan of it. It was uh, the first time I'd ever heard it was in this space. Yeah. Right. And uh, getting to mix on it the first weekend was quite the pleasure. It was, it was very effortless to, yeah. to bring a mix up on, which was lucky for me because we had very little time. <laughs> so yes, we did. that was, that I was, was there. A it sounded amazing. Trey killed it as per usual. 
Um, so that's PA. Anything yeah. else to add on uh, PA? I guess the last thing, and one of the deciding factors for us, I would say deciding factor, but one of the pushes for us to use Zell Acoustics was that the church had recently updated their uh, power amplifiers or okay. controllers yep. in the Zell Acoustics world. Um, so they had controllers that were current, current technology still, and uh, we were able to build around those and not have to rebuy that. Right. Which was a nice help to the budget. It right. was a significant amount of money. Because again, and we say this all the time, no matter what church it is, no matter the size of the church, budget is always something we have to consider well, in a project. Of course. I mean, it's stewardship, right? I yeah. mean, it matters to us. It's not just the church that, that we're working with that, that's worried about the stewardship of the money. We, we worry about it too. We have to answer for that just like everyone else. Right. Well, so that's PA. Let's talk through console. Um, let's talk through IO infrastructure. Sure. Starting off here, what do we have? All right, so we've got the brand new Digico Quantum 338. It's um, latest and greatest from Digico. Uh, the, the reason we stuck with Digico in this project is they had Digico already. So they already knew the platform. They already owned uh, SD racks. They already owned two SD tens. We needed three consoles to fill out the package. They already had two. It made no sense to try and move away from that platform at this right. point. So we added the 338. We added some orange boxes for some network I.O. that we needed. And that gave us the whole the whole package with, honestly, a very small hit to the budget. Yep. That was that was a, a big win for us. We had to uh, we had to bring them up to the OptiCore loop topology. Yep. Pri previously, they were just doing MADI networking between the consoles. Sure. So, and we've moved now to OptiCore being correct. the thing between them. Yeah. Awesome. Once we went to three desks and adding in the MADI infrastructure for video interface and all that, it kind of required OptiCore at that yep, point. Yeah, absolutely. We also have a Waves rig, of mm -hmm. course. Um, just a quick hit. What's this plugin you got brought sure. up? So this is PSE. Um, it is it stands for Primary Source Enhancer. It's uh, it's probably one of my uh, one of my favorite plugins. This is a very simple plugin. But if you could think of it as a glorified gate, but intended for <laughs> intended for vocal or primary sources, it it really does uh, does help you stabilize a source, especially if you've got something that's right at the edge of feedback or having to operate very close or in a highly ambient space. It really does stabilize that source. Mix trips or mix mix tips tips trips tips whatever I, I can't I can't say it correctly yeah. with Trey. Um, let's go ahead and move on to cameras. Yeah. So what do we have behind us? We're going to move over and step up at the same time because we got to get above people's heads. Right, right. Um, so if you notice, we're pretty close to the ceiling. We have two cameras, camera one and two in front of house. Mm -hmm. So talk us through what do we have on these tripods? What lenses? What are the right. tripods as well? Right, just, right. All the way through. So we've got the Canon C300 Mark III's with all Canon glass. They're full servo lenses, um, full all cinema style cameras here. The every camera in the system is a is a C300 cinema camera. Yeah. Um, we use the Multidyne fiber systems okay. to kind of bring these cinema systems into a live production world. That's a that's a challenge with most cinema cameras just to try to integrate them into a live production, right? Right. This, this accomplished that for us with Multidyne. We've got a combination of products from them, um, from the very simple fiber interfaces here to on stage when we get to those cameras, you'll see more of a traditional fiber back with a empty fiber plugged right in. Right. So we, we, we kind of picked and choose what we need there for to, uh, to make budget work, right? Yep. So no sense in spending money where it wasn't helpful. And just to talk through that really fast and how much Multidyne mm -hmm. has been a help to us in designing these systems. Sure. As the church world has started to shift from the broadcast style to the cinematic world, the infrastructure has been the thing that has been difficult to figure out. Right. Trying to figure out how do we make these cinematic cameras work inside of the, with the broadcast style function that we mm -hmm. need. You know, why is Multidyne the right fit in this, in, in this installation? Right, so Multidyne for us has been more about the partnership. Yeah. Right? They're always involved. They're always helpful. They always answer the phone, which is a big deal, right? It's a big deal. So they will, uh, they came alongside of us. They're also in town, which is super nice. So on this project specifically, the timeline was probably the, the largest challenge. Everything you see here, none of it was harder than the timeline we had to do it in. Yeah. So. The fact that they were close, they were able to come to the site when there were when there were issues with temporary solutions that they were providing. They jumped right in, helped us out, got it working. 
Uh, so that that was a big deal. You know, any any company that's willing to jump in like that is yep. a company that we're going to stand behind and support and, and and push down the road. So absolutely, they've been good to us. We've got a fifty to one thousand mm -hmm. lens on camera one, a twenty five to fifty lens on camera two. Let's talk about tripods. What right. are we rocking? So we use Miller. Um, they're they're kind of our go to for most projects. That until we get into the super large format broadcast cameras where we get it, get really heavy. Um, we almost always stay with Miller. They, they hit a price point and quality balance that it, no one else in my mind really, really gets. Um, these are a, a bit of a combination system here, but we've got their pedestals with the Skyline 70 heads, and that gave us the, the weight and smoothness we needed for these cameras, uh, as well as our ability to raise and lower this camera during the service. So this theater, we didn't have the space either in ceiling height or floor to get above heads the way we really wanted to with these cameras at a fixed height. So given the rake of the floor and whatnot, we knew that for worship, the cameras needed to be at one height. Yep. And for the sermon, we really wanted them back down uh, more level with pastor. Yeah. So we used the, the pedestal. At the end of the day, it's, it was a very small delta between this and a fixed tripod. Sure. So that was another big win with Miller is that they actually give you an offering like this that doesn't break the bank. Yeah. So and I'll, it helped. I'll jump in really fast and talk about the, the creative element that comes with being able to have that flexibility mm -hmm. in height. So, you know, in a broadcast situation where someone is not experiencing what's going on in the room, we want people to feel like they're in the room. We want right. people to feel like they're in that experience. And so being able to, through worship, have your pedestal at a height to where you can shoot through raised hands, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of stylistic or creative flexibility you have even literally by just raising the height of your cameras. Right. And so Miller provides that for us in a great way. Right. And, and, and to that effect, too, even when you go to the sermon, being able to come back down yep. and have heads in the shot of the sermon, it helps people at home connect. Hey, there you're watching with someone. You're not right. just by yourself watching somebody on a screen, right? You're connected to a whole group of other people. Absolutely. That's good. Well, let's, uh, let's jump on down sure. to lighting. So we have lighting console over here. We'll talk about fixtures when we get to stage. Um, but we also have the architectural lighting in here. So let's start with that. What is the backbone of this system? All right, so the system is, is driven by Grand MA3 hardware. This is a, um, a compact from Grand MA3. Uh, we, we love MA, the MA line because they give us a broad range of options that all run the same software, give you all the same features. It's just scale of surface and output count. Sure. So that's helpful, um, and we, we really appreciate their ability to, to scale up and down with us given the project budgets. Um, all of that is riding on an ETC network that was existing. We updated it, brought it onto our, our new technical network, and have, uh, have updated some other pieces of that, that older system as well. But all of the output nodes throughout the project are all ETC. Yeah. The, uh, the relay systems in the building are all ETC as well. Sure. So you talk about network. Uh, we talked about network for audio. Mm -hmm. There's network for video. There's network for lighting. Mm -hmm. Everything is based off of network these days. Right. So I know that we have some more network stuff going on inside of this design. Let's talk about that for a second. Sure. What does the network infrastructure look like for the whole project? So the entire system's running on Netgear 4250 series switches, which is an AV industry purpose-built switch platform that Netgear developed. Uh, it's not very old, actually. It's only a, a year or two old, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's all in this project, 10 gig backbone between the switches. So we've got tons of bandwidth and we're bringing all the different networks across that same package. So we use different VLANs to segregate the traffic as needed. Uh, and we're able to keep uh, we're able to keep the network all together, which is nice, so we can bring up any network we need at any location. Sure. Which is, which is so flexible for us because we don't ever, ever know what the church is going to want to do tomorrow. Right. So at front of house, we have a switch that I can bring up any technical network on. Right. Same in the lighting lighting positions, same in broadcast, same at monitor world. Anywhere I need network of any flavor, I have it. Right. And it saved money as well, so we're not, we're not duplicating switches in places. I don't have to put two different switches here. For audio and then lighting. Correct, right. Just one. Just one switch, different VLANs. So what do we love about the Netgear so series? So one of the things about the 4250 line is they really thought about how it integrates into the AV world. Yeah. 
all of the ports are on the rear of the switch, which is you know somewhat opposite of what everyone's used to. It looks sexy in a rack. It, it does. looks really good. So now our racks no longer have piles of cable coming through the front to connect to the switches. It's all on the back. It dresses out just like everything else in the rack does. Right. Which is really nice. What else? One other thing you like. So about? probably my the thing that attracted me to that switch before that was the user interface. They really built a end user minded GUI for the technical people at, that are using those switches to, to operate. It's not, uh, it's not IT guru based. <laughs> it does have that side for the IT nerds that want to do it. Right? Sure. But for every AV operator out there that needs just needs to hop in, spin up a different VLAN on a port, you can do that very simply. Uh, they really made that easy to use, yeah. which very few switch manufacturers think about that part of the world. Right? Sure. Because that's just not what they're building for. Right. And these guys did it. Yeah. So. Two more things, and then we'll move up to the stage. Number one is notice that Audio World and at Lighting, we have a multi-viewer in both mm -hmm. of these locations. Let's talk about the importance of having that available to the operators. Right. So you know, for the audio guy, it's, it's really more about queuing, right? So they're able to see different camera shots that are, ha that are in the room. They're also able to see uh, graphics packages on the on the multi viewer as they're starting as they're prepping to roll, so they're able to to get some visual cueing as well as any producer cues that may be coming over intercom. For lighting, it's uh, equally important for the cueing as it is for looking at at the imaging that's coming back from video. Yeah. So they're able to see, okay, is, is that looking blown out? Are they not able to get enough light, you know, for that shot? So they're able to, to really take some visual cues on their own without the engineer and video saying, hey, I need more yeah, light here. Sure. It's always nice if the operator can just look and make the, make the correction on their own. Right, absolutely. Final thing I want to talk about is you talked about intercom for mm -hmm. just a moment. What are we using for comm on this project? Right, so this is all based on the ClearCom HelixNet platform. Okay. It's a traditional party line minded platform, but modernized to be digital. So it will uh, it'll run on a couple different topologies. In this case, we're doing all over IP once again. So it runs on its own VLAN on our central technical network. Um, and then we have a wireless component to that as well from ClearCom. It's the brand new FreeSpeak Edge platform it gives us some four channel belt packs uh, on the five gigahertz platform as well as some two channel belt packs on the traditional 1.9 gigahertz platform which is which is great since they already owned a pile of those right the we, we knew we wanted the the nicer newer belt packs for the producers here yeah just for the for to serve their needs but they already had a bunch of the existing units well this new base station allowed us to use them both yep so that budget, nice. right? Budget, exactly. Budget. Always comes down to budget. Yeah. Anytime we could reuse something, why not? Why right? Not? This money's already been spent. Let's let's make it work for us. That's right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and move on up to Monitor World. We're gonna talk about what's going on on the stage. Are we good? All right. So we have made our way up to Monitor World, and uh, Trey, we have a lot of things to talk about here. First, I want to bring up something that you saw at front of house. We didn't bring it up then. You see it now at Monitor World, and you're going to see it in broadcast as well. And that's the custom desks and furniture and racks that we have with Forecast. So talk right. about our partnership with Forecast. So this was uh, this was ironically our first project with Forecast uh, consoles and it has instantly formed a tight bond with that company. Um, we've got them in multiple other projects already since this one. Um, so all the furniture you see in the technical spaces here at Times Square is provided by Forecast. It's all custom designed and built for us. Um, these, everything from these racks to what the consoles are sitting on. At front of house, it was the desks that the consoles were sitting on. And when we go upstairs, you'll see more of it. But the guys do an incredible job of taking what we tell them we need and the actual pieces of equipment that we tell them we're putting in it and making the desks fit them just right and giving us all the different ways we need to move cable between the, the spaces. They provide us a, a conduit for that. So we've been really, really pleased with them. This was a great project to start with them at because again, they're local to New York. So they brought their crews over and assembled and installed the, the desks with us. So it was, a really, it was a really great opportunity for a first time partnership with those guys. While you're already over there, let's mm -hmm. talk about wireless. Sure, okay. Ha, huh, ironic, sure. So sure. <laughs> we, we will see a rack Trace full got the jokes. of Sure wireless gear here. Everything ranging from the Axient Digital microphone systems to the PSM 1000 in-ear systems and a couple straggling PSM 900s down here still. Plenty of place for those. There's actually a few more over there. So 
We, uh, we're a big fan of the Accent Digital Package. They give us the most frequency density, and when we're in a place like New York City, in the middle that of is Times Square. <laughs> in the middle of Times Square, uh, you know, frequency agility is so important to us. So these guys do a great job of that, um, and, and at a really fair price point as well, which again, we always are, are conscious of. Um, the rechargeable battery systems that Sure has is probably top in the industry right now as well. Uh, another really big deal with churches, uh, especially if you're working on small crews, right? If you don't have a massive staff to maintain all of your gear, something as simple as dropping in your wireless systems into the chargers as your talent comes off stage is huge, right? That's one less thing you have to do. So we, we do really appreciate that from Sure. No more buckets of partially used AA batteries right. and nine volts laying around everywhere. Right, right. And, so, and it's just a recurring, uh, recurring budget item that goes away. Which is which is nice. Yeah. So. Well, let's talk through. We've got the SD racks mm -hmm. placed here for the stage as well. So this goes into the whole I/O ecosystem for audio. Right. And then we move over to monitor world. Let's talk through uh, the console that we're using right here. Right. So we're using the Digico SD10. This is one of two SD10s that the church already owned. Uh, again, we just brought it forward onto the OptoCore network and implemented it here at Monitor World. The other one is in broadcast audio. We'll see that a little bit later. One of the specific things that we added in to the package for Monitor World here is the clang system. So we've got an orange box from Digico racked in the back of this cabinet with a clang card. And you can see the interface for it on the screen here. Um, that gives the musicians the ability to spatially place things in their mix as well as volume. Right, so now not, we're not only mixing volume in their in-ear monitors, but we're also mixing spatially so we can move it around their head, forward and backwards in the space, vertical, up and down. It really does change the landscape of what they're hearing. Right, and it's a big deal for the people who are on stage leading worship. We want oh, yeah. them to make sure that they've got great in-ear mixes. Right. We're bringing the best out of the talent on stage. Right. So right. again, we've talked through having a multi-viewer at mm -hmm. the different serving positions. We have one at Monitor World as well. Right. Um, and then some more clear comm for us to be talking with the rest of the crew. Of course. So uh, anything else you want to yeah. expound on inside of this? We'll talk real quick about why the SD racks are right here. They kind of look like, well, that's just a big waste of space here at Monitor World. Well, in this application, we're on a theatrical stage. This is a big performance stage that uh, in the intent here is going to still remain that. Uh, they, they do have desire to use this space still for theatrical production. So it wasn't practical necessarily to go in and install a bunch of infrastructure all over the stage. Right. So this stage works like a typical theater stage. All cable comes off the side of the stage and patches right here at Monitor World. So the, the racks needed to be here to give us the IO uh, location that we were after. Right. We could have remoted them at a pretty great cost and to have to bring all that copper back up here just to connect anyway. So it made sense just to let them be here. We had the space for it. Uh, so that's why you see those right there. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's turn our attention to the actual stage mm -hmm. and let's talk about lighting for a second. So we've got a whole light grid over the stage. Mm -hmm. We have key light in some very specific and, and unique positions here, right. um, as well as we've got some traditional box booms right. over here. Uh, but we have one manufacturer for lighting on this job. Yeah, and that it's... it's um... <laughs> It's funny how we even got there, right? So when this project started, it was a, a bit different landscape lighting wise. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, our friends at Elation came to the table and were able to deliver for us. Yeah. Um, they were able to meet all the specs that we had for the project and meet the timeline where no one else came close to that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, the guys at Elation have been a great partner for us on this project and the, uh, the, the results have been fantastic. Yeah. So we've been really happy. Let's talk for a moment about the key light. Mm -hmm. So we have Elation Fuse Wash FR. So right. why do we like that fixture for key light? Sure, so the Fuse Wash FR gives us a ton of output in a soft wash, soft edge wash fixture and gives us framing shutters, or in this case, more of like a motorized barn door, if you will. So it lets us uh, really control the output of the fixture and where the light goes, as well as giving us that nice soft edge to give us a smooth wash for yeah. our broadcast. Awesome. So uh, let's talk through the video components, the cameras that we mm -hmm. have on stage and inside of the room outside of cameras one and two, and then we'll go ahead and move on up into broadcast. Perfect. World. So, uh, we have some more, the unique is the theme about this job. Right. Um, so broadcast video was the number one goal, the number one priority in which we filtered decisions on this, on this right. design. Um, so having 
a dynamic experience online mattered a ton, as well as the ability to feature this room mm -hmm. in on it, like, because this isn't your typical auditorium, we've mm -hmm. already talked about that, being able to feature the beauty of the room on the online experience as well. Mm -hmm. So that resulted in one of two Furios being placed on the stage. So Ross Furio, this is our first install with them. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about your experience with them. How have you felt with the Furio on stage, the Furio in the room? Let's just talk through right. this for a moment. Sure. So we've, uh, we've, we've talked to our friends at Ross about Furio for years. We've, we've actually taken the Furio into a lot of places. Yeah. We've, we've, really, uh, we've really gotten behind the Furio concept. Um, at the end of the day, Furio is a, is a pricey option but it does give you a tool that there's no other way to achieve that shot, uh, especially in a consistently moving application. Uh, lots of ways to make a shot move across, across the screen. To have a shot that can start and stop and stay on air the whole time, very few products can do it. Not shake. Furio, yeah, right, right. Furio does it so fantastically. So we've got one Furio on stage here and they move it from time to time. It started out more upstage behind the drums now it's all the way on stage right, and they're using it as a up-down movement. Uh, and then we've got the Fur Furio on the balcony face. The Furio on the balcony may be the most unique Furio application that, um, that we've even looked at yeah. to date. Um, it's not a hanging Furio. It's a track-mounted Furio riding on top of the track across the top of the balcony face. And this balcony is different, we'll say, like most things in this How room. How different? It is all, not only curved, but okay. it's also sloped from the center down towards the outsides. So we had to level the track on that curve, on a custom curve. So it was quite unique, and uh, the guys at Ross worked with us phenomenally to come up with a custom track for it. Uh, and the field engineer came out and helped implement that as well. Yeah. And it, it was a huge success. It's been, it's been great. Outside of the cool factor of mm -hmm. it, because I mean, it's, it's pretty freaking oh, cool. It's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> like, why, why was this the, the right tool for the job? Right. So our challenge here in this balcony was, again, with the historic nature of it, we couldn't really take away seats up there, but we know we wanted that shot. We knew we wanted that shot. So what shot are you referencing? Just we, movement in the room? We wanted, well, there were two, two aspects of it. We wanted a shot from that position in the sure. balcony, right? And it was a great space, space to shoot from, especially when we're dealing with choir because our choir's elevated here. Um, we needed a shot that got the choir elevation, you know, properly, as well as just a high and wide shot for, of pastor during, during sermon elements and whatnot. The other piece of it is the fact that we can now move the shot so it travels. So now we can get a dynamic movement from a raised perspective, uh, something that without a product like Furio, there'd be no way to get, especially sure. in this space. Because again, we couldn't take away seats. Right. We couldn't create a camera position anywhere up there. When jib is not an option. <laughs> right, there was no place for a jib. And there was no place sensibly for an operator. Sure. Right, we needed an automated solution. Yep, and Ross delivered on that. They did. So in addition to the Furios, we have two more cameras that are roaming around. So we have one more C300 Mark III, mm -hmm. and this is where we get to another Multidime product involved. So right. talk about the fiber back that we've got. So we have a full-blown silver back system for Multidyne for the stage camera. So it's a traditional Simpty fiber plugged straight into the camera back, right? That's the idea here. We needed a, a system that the guy could walk around with, with one cable connecting him up with intercom, power, right. uh, video, all of that in one solution. Yeah, especially because a lot, and this is a stylistic thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where we want vision to be the deciding factor for gear. Where mobile cam, we want to be able to have the flexibility to get some tight shots, move mm -hmm. around, but also still have the ability for lens control, camera right. control, uh, you know, the CCUs to still be able to control all of that. So that's where the fiber back definitely helps, especially when we're using the easy rig for the roaming mm -hmm. camera. Right, right. We have one more camera on the job, and this is a C70 um, that an operator is using with a tilt to float and an RS2 uh, from DJI. So, a lot of movement happening on the stage, a lot of uh, shots taken in right. that creative, uh, the creative way. Yeah. And of interest, that camera, that C70 is also has a wireless link. Yes. So we're using the Clearcom wireless intercom solution with that camera, as well as a wireless video solution there. Which is the? Man, I tell you. That's right, yeah. It's a Teradek. Which is a Teradek wireless solution. There you go. I knew one more thing than Trey did. Yeah, I was gonna remember. Never happens. 
next step is for us to talk about the tow light here, which is yeah. a very unique thing. Again, unique is the word, unique New York. Unique yeah, New York. Unique. Let's, uh, let's talk about the tow light and then let's head up to broadcast. Right, so we took a product from TMB uh, called Floppy Tape. Um, kind of a fun name, but very it's just, one. yeah, right. It's just a, an LED tape, but it is a very color accurate, variable white tape that we were able to put into a custom, um, custom channel that we milled into the stage to make it come out perfectly flush with the top of the, of the stage cap. Uh, we wanted, because we knew they entered up and down on the face of the stage, we couldn't have anything that stuck up beyond right. that, that cap. So couldn't uh, recess anything. Right, really we, couldn't, we couldn't recess any further either because again, the tow, for, to be an accurate tow light, it couldn't be below the stage lip. Yeah. So we were able to take this product and mill it in perfectly flush uh, and it does a phenomenal job, looks great on camera. Yeah, and we put a frosted tire or a mm -hmm. lens on top of it right. to and diffuse that's a, some of the light. That's a track and lens, an extrusion and lens solution from TMB for that, custom made for that product. Uh, and it, it fit right in great. So there's one more thing on the project I want to talk through that is not necessarily a part of our project, mm -hmm. but it's a huge part of what you can see in the background on this video. And that's right. all of the stage pieces and LED. Right. So, you know, Talk about what that looked like and how we interfaced with that. Sure. So all of the set design on this project, an LED wall, um, as well as all the back visual elements here uh, and choir risers were a part of a prior contract before we got involved with the church. So we are controlling it with the lighting system like any other lighting element would be, but we didn't actually provide any of that. That was already uh, already designed and in the process of implementation when we came on. So we worked with the other contractor pretty seamlessly to, to make it all go together with everything we were doing. And I think that's the important thing in our industry in general is that you know we, we work really hard to, to get along with everybody because we're, we're all here for the same purpose. So. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and let's go to the broadcast. Let's see what's going on in there. Oh man, I got all kind of text messages. All right, here we go. So we are now inside of the broadcast room or the production room, or what do we want to call this? Yeah, I'd say call it the video production room. Video is, production room. Yeah, this is where they control all the feeds coming in and out of the building for video. Yep, so got a lot to talk through in here. Um, let's just start with overall 30,000 foot view of the video infrastructure. Okay, great. So the entire system is built around a Ross router. So we use the Ultrix platform, which combines our switching and video routing, as well as audio embedding, disembedding, and multi-viewing all in one box. Uh, the, the advantage of that is we don't have a lot of signal coming in and out of different pieces of gear, fewer points of failure, and a, a way better control system since we're controlling one piece of hardware. Yeah, absolutely. So we have that as the router. Now, what are we using for switching? So again, it's a Ross switcher. It's the Carbonite platform. If you're familiar with the Ross Carbonite Ultra, it's the same switcher in a blade format that goes in the router frame. Yeah. So this was our first install with the blade format, right. correct? Right, so this is the first time we've implemented that. Um, we learned a lot through that process. Uh, it was all good though. We're putting it in multiple other sites now. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you can see behind us, we have some more beautiful forecast desk mm -hmm. that uh, custom designed for this space. That crew did an amazing job with that. Um, and a lot of empty chairs where people are serving. So a lot of different serving positions that make right. this happen on a weekend. So let's go station by station, starting with the front left, all the way down front uh, serving position. So what is that? Sure, so we've got a position for a general producer role, yep. right? So this, that position is intended to be the producer that's overseeing all of the live production. So followed by that is the broadcast switching position where they're switching what goes out for their broadcast. So it's what, the Ross touch drive okay, perfect. TD2 panel. Yep. It's a TD2S actually. So a few more buttons than the traditional TD2. Um, and then just keeping going across that row, we've got the Furio control position. This is where they control all of the robotics. So right? both all, cameras. Yeah, both cameras, both Furio tracks mm -hmm. controlled from one position. Correct. Awesome. And with most robotic camera systems, you're using presets, right? Yeah. And it's not a traditional preset where you hit the button and it snaps to that position. It's fully programmable. You can control the start and stop speed, the speed through positions. I mean, you, you, you get a ton of granularity to that. Yeah. So they control both of those from there. And then the far right position 
is where we do all the painting and shading of the cameras. So that's yeah. the traditional engineering position where they where they do coloring and and shading for the, all the camera shots. Yep. And a fun thing that works alongside of these CCUs for, for Canon specifically mm -hmm. is there's lens control inside of that right. as well. So it's pretty unique, really. It is unique. Again, another application of the word unique, but also like from a uh, for in a church environment where you have volunteers and plenty of times where you're training and onboarding volunteers, uh, focus can sometimes not be exactly what you want. Absolutely. So one thing we get with these camera systems from Canon is the ability to actually focus the lens from the ROP up here in the control room. So there's nothing better than looking at a big engineering monitor and being able to touch up focus on the fly for that operator. It's really nice. Just to help them out a little bit. Right, right. Volunteers. And most of the time, you don't even say anything. Yeah. You just do it you in the background, let it be. God, God loves them. That's right. That's right. Second row, let's talk about these positions over here, starting left again. Right. So we've got our primary graphics operator there that's putting out all the content for uh, for what would be considered like the iMag screens. Here it's a little different, so it's just one LED strip. Yep. But what would be going in the iMag positions on that strip, that's the graphics package for that. Yep. Followed by the LED screen control position where they're actually controlling the LED screen itself. Yep. So kind of like routing of right. what goes on that one screen. Right. Breaking up the content. Cool. Moving back to this one, last one. So the back rows, the design intent behind this was a dedicated control and switching position for the live room experience. Sure. So it's a smaller position because at the end of the day, it's actually a lot less going on on what happens on the main screen in the room than there is what's going to air per right. se, for the broadcast. So it's a smaller panel, still controlling the same switcher blade, yep. same infrastructure, just another control panel for that, controlling the ME that's feeding the LED wall screen package. Right. And this configuration is always super helpful, especially whenever you have pre-recorded content, when you're wanting to place different material at different times in the service to different outputs. Right, right. And so what we'll do a lot of times here in this type of scenario is we'll have different graphics that may go on the screen for the live experience than what goes on air, right? You might need that built differently. You might need it in right. a different position on the screen, things like that. So the graphics packages are often different, hence the separate graphics positions, uh, as well as these positions are taking care of sermon notes and things like that for the stage display screens. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the multi-viewers. Mm -hmm. Size TVs, what are we doing? All right, so we've got three 65-inch displays that are effectively wall-to-wall -wall in the front, and we're feeding those off of the multi-view outputs of both the Ultrix router. Yep as well as the Carbonite switcher blade. So we're taking advantage of both multi-viewing systems here mm -hmm. to get the output count we needed. Uh, the Ultrix platform allows you to license up multi-viewer heads as you need. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Carbonite blade comes with two multi-viewer outputs already. Yeah. So we were able to, on this project, leverage the two outputs from the switcher blade as well as three licensed outputs. So we've got five different multi-viewer heads that we can configure and put around the campus where we need them. Yeah, awesome. So finally, right behind the camera right now is the CER. Mm -hmm. um, and then behind that, we have broadcast audio. Right. And just like everything in New York City, real estate, is that, <laughs> is that a premium? That's a premium. So space was a little bit tight when it came to this install, but let's talk about what goes on inside of there. Right, so we've got uh, the other SD10 that we talked about that was part of their package is in that space with uh, a, a couple of pairs of monitors so they can choose between the large format Genelec system as well as some, some R-Tone smaller format monitors so they can bounce between that and always have a good reference point uh, for the broadcast. People listen on all kinds of devices, right? right. So you gotta give them different options to listen to as well when they're mixing in there. Um, it is a tiny space. It does have a, a really nice acoustics package for that space from, uh, from one of our partner companies that we used for this specific project. Yeah to help design that. Um, wall, how many layers of acoustic oh treatment goodness, yeah. are built into the wall? Right, it's, uh, depending on which wall, <laughs> there's anywhere from three different layers of the acoustic package down to one layer on some walls. So it's, it's a very custom design for that. Yeah. And so finally, we've got a waves rig there, and then we're tracking audio as well. Right, right. So we are, they're using Pro Tools to track all their audio, uh, and it's all coming across the waves sound grid platform. We're using waves for processing as well as transport for tracking. Um, one thing about this space that we're in 
is none of this room existed the way it is now when we started on this project. This was, the room we're standing in was three different spaces originally. Right. Uh, and the production space for audio didn't exist at all. Yeah. That was just part of another room. So in the short time window of this project, all of this construction had to happen as well. Right. So literally the, the team at the church, from the day we met with them, even before the contract began, started demolition and construction on this project purely based on our initial site visit. Right. <laughs> so it moved that quickly. Yeah. So anything else you want to talk about inside of this space? Anything of note? Um, I guess the last piece of it, not knowing what the future held, if you'll notice, this room feels a little larger than most spaces in the, in the building, uh, and it almost could feel like, oh, wow, you wasted space there. Well, it's actually designed intent for a fourth row to go in. Yeah. So they could actually expand to one more row of graphics operation for the live experience if the need grows. Right. For we like a, to, another room inside of the building. Or another room in the building, or if the if the production itself grows, if they they're doing more and need more operators. Yeah. We made sure that the room could expand with them. Yeah. Don't want to be landlocked. Nope. Don't. Want to, yeah. You can only uh, you can only grow as many seats as you have, right? So if you need more operators, you got to have a place to put them. So this room was designed and the conduit infrastructure is already in place to add another row. Yeah. Planning for the future. You got to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have talked through a lot. Trey has nerded out on a lot of gear. Hey, if you have any additional questions, feel free to message us. We'll gladly reply on anything that we miss. But thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. If you are looking at doing a, some sort of update, whether it's audio, video, lighting at your church, here's the deal. We would love to talk to you about it. We are all about relationship. We're all about helping the church. Yes, we, we nerd out on this stuff, but you know, ideally the reason why we do what we do is to help the church. So if you're in that position, you're looking at a new building or you're upfitting your existing space, please reach out. We'd love to help you with your next project. Until then, thank you for watching.